But on the next day, all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And when the congregation had assembled against Moses and against Aaron, they turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared, and Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from the midst of this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces, and Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer. Put fire on it from the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For the wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron took it as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. And behold, the plague had already begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting when the plague was stopped. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and get them from them staffs, one for each father's house from all their chiefs according to their father's houses, 12 staffs. Write each man's name on his staff, and write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. For there shall be one staff for the head of each father's house, and then you shall deposit them in the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. And the staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. Thus I will make to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against you. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and all their chiefs gave him staffs, one for each chief, according to their father's houses, twelve staffs. And the staff of Aaron was among their staffs. And Moses deposited the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. And on the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from before the Lord to all the people of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his staff. And the Lord said to Moses, Put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. Thus did Moses, as the Lord commanded him, so he did. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish. We are undone. We are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? Thus ends the reading of God's word. Have you ever thought your parents hated you? (laughs) Have you ever thought your parents were trying to kill you? Like the time they put poisonous plants on your dinner plate, otherwise known as broccoli. (laughs) Or teens, like the time they said no to the thing that you assured them you could not live without. You told them in no uncertain terms that failure to provide such access or such permission or such funds would result in you shriveling up into a prune and dying purely from lack of parental love. They had the audacity to call your bluff. You didn't die. That's beside the point. They were willing to experiment with your life. Sometimes it's funny in hindsight what we thought constituted hatred. What we thought would kill us. But sadly, sometimes it's quite serious. A parental authority can hate a child. And sadly, a parent can want to kill a child. The most known and noted examples of this are abortion. 
So the fear of such a thing, filicide, comes from a sad reality. But the problem alluded to in our text today is the fear of an authority, a spiritual authority, killing their own people. Now, many of God's people under the spiritual authority of Moses and Aaron had just died. There was the rebellion of Korah. Korah said, we want to be priests just like Moses. And Moses and Aaron are accused of killing them. But it was really the Lord who had done the killing in such a fantastic way, the earth swallowing them, that Moses and Aaron should really be exempt from suspicion. But the problem is, that our sin causes us to suspect our authorities who are legitimately over us, who are legitimately exercising their rule, we think of them as wanting to kill us. We suspect that our spiritual leaders want to kill us. We suspect them because we are sinful and God is holy And they communicate to us God's word and judgments. And just like Adam and Eve of old who hid in the garden when they heard God walking, so we too run away or spit venom when God's representatives draw near to us in our sin. We don't like to be called on our sin. And when the Israelites saw sin being judged, they were afraid. And now it is good to fear God, but our healthy fear of God becomes a twisted tool of the devil if we add to that fear a suspicion of our spiritual authorities, especially our highest spiritual authority. Now, if you think that you don't need a spiritual authority, you are naive, you are foolish. If you don't think you have a spiritual authority as a Christian, you certainly do. Jesus Christ. God appointed him high priest for our life and growth. Let's stop rebelling against him. God has appointed a high priest. It's for our life and growth. So the least we can do is not rebel against him. But when we sin, we are rebelling against our good, God-ordained, spiritual authority, Jesus, and your rebellion isn't justified. You have a good high priest. You have a perfect high priest. He's not trying to kill you. He's trying to give you life and life more abundantly, and you need a high priest. You need someone to stand between you and a holy God. And if you are in Christ, you have a high priest whose priesthood is not only good, but permanent. Aaron was a sinner, yet the Israelites were killed for rebelling against his priesthood. Jesus is sinless, and he intercedes for you even now before the heavenly holy of holies. And so, good Christian, you might say, I don't rebel against my high priest. I love my high priest. I love Jesus. Then... Listen to the Spirit of Jesus as his under-shepherds preach the word of Christ against you, rebuking you of your sins. Hear them and neither grumble nor rebel. Look at verse uh, 47. So 16, 47. A plague breaks out amongst God's people. Or 46, for the wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. A plague breaks out amongst God's people because of their opposition to Aaron's priesthood. And this is the deadliest plague I've ever heard of. Death seems almost instantaneous. And notice which direction Aaron is walking. Main point number one, the high priest's steps into the danger zone of God's wrath. God had said, I'm going to destroy them, get away from them. Moses says, take the censer, go towards them. And so a good high priest, a loving high priest, 
steps into the danger zone of God's wrath. The Lord had just said to Moses and Aaron, get away from them. I'm going to destroy them. The Lord had in the previous passage destroyed those in rebellion by opening up the earth underneath them. Yet notice which direction Aaron's walking into the danger zone of God's wrath. Had the Lord struck people dead before because of their standing, because of, their, of the geography of their position? Yes. Had Aaron ever rebelled against the Lord's anointed? Yes. Had the Lord ever struck people dead for lighting incense incorrectly? Yes. And yet, behold, Aaron lighting incense and walking toward a rebellious people. What a beautiful picture of a priest. Previously, we've seen the priest as the one who must take up the sword of judgment against even brother for the Lord. But in this story, we see what Moses had demonstrated multiple times, intercession for a sinful people. Aaron risks for those who had just been grumbling against him. Why? Aaron heads toward the plague with nothing but a censer. Why? Because main point number two, the high priest takes up an instrument of death in order to save. Look at verses 46 and 47. 46, take your censer and put fire in it on it from off the altar. Now, even though a censer, guys, looks like a medieval morning star, okay, it's got like a pole and a chain and then a ball, there's nothing deadly about it. Uh, but it was the very tool that not a chapter ago was the instrument of destruction of hundreds of would-be priests. The sons of Levi challenged Aaron and said that the priesthood should be for all of Levi and beyond. All God's people are holy, so all God's people should be priests. And the Lord said, fine, try offering me incense when I haven't chosen you as priests. See what happens. They did, they died. And in this passage, the Lord tells Aaron to take up a censer. That thing, he might have said. But Aaron takes up the censer, puts a burning coal and incense in it, and begins waving it as he walks toward the people and the plague. Aaron is risking his life in more ways than one in order to save the people who were complaining about him. And in a genius move, the Lord allows Aaron to be the very instrument whereby the rebels' lives are saved. God's rebellious people said of Aaron, he's killing us. And now Aaron is literally saving them. In God's economy, he allowed the burnt incense coming from Aaron's censer to be the very means by which the plague would be thwarted. God's justice is miraculous as the Lord somehow allows the uh, proximity of burning incense to counteract the very spread of the plague. So his justice is miraculous, his salvation is miraculous. And the scientists among us are asking, but how? And we don't have the answer to that question. But the text does provide us with the answer to the question, but why? Why the Lord allows the plague to stop right in line with where Aaron had stepped was to reveal the Lord's choice of Aaron as intercessory priest. The Lord was painting here a very vivid picture of what a priest is for, interposing himself between the wrath of God and a sinful people and who the Lord had chosen. We still need that. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still holy. He is still angry at each new rebellion against him. God's people are still sinful. Aaron is not our high priest anymore, but that doesn't mean we don't need a high priest. It doesn't mean we don't have a high priest. Whoever the Lord appoints as our high priest, that's who we should submit to, neither rebelling against him nor attempting to be our own high priest. But how are God's people to know who is their high priest? 
Might not some enterprising charlatan who liked attention and honor call himself your new high priest? Main point number three. The Lord gives symbols to rebels to prove his high priest. The Lord gives symbols to rebels to prove his high priest. The Lord does not ask people to just have faith. He proves what he is doing on the pages of history with multiple witnesses. And in the passage before us today, the Lord powerfully, visibly, before many witnesses, proved that Aaron was to be called the high priest. And this is not magic. This is not Moses' sleight of hand while no one's looking, replacing an almond branch in the middle of night with a staff marked of Aaron's. No. No, this is really the Lord's doing. And previously in the Exodus, the Lord, through Mos- uh, the Lord uh, through Moses went up directly against the magicians of Egypt, revealing bit by bit that they could not keep up by magic with what the Lord was doing by miracle. And here, Aaron's staff budding is a miracle, impossible to recreate through engineering, even of ours today. So each staff was carved carefully with the name of each tribal leader. And this would not be easy to recarve under cover of the middle of the night in a, a tent campsite where everyone's watching. Furthermore, even if Moses had gone and cut and carved a similar looking branch, notice how the branch buds, flowers, and almonds all over it, various stages of growth and fruitfulness before their eyes. Ripe almonds ready to be harvested. And this is symbolic of the continuous fruitfulness, the fruitfulness unto completion represented in the Aaronic high priesthood. The Aaronic high priesthood would bless with beauty and usefulness to God's kingdom as they with integrity ministered before the Lord for hundreds of years, processing the sacrifices for sin brought by God's people. And what grace that the Lord gives this symbol to rebels. Did you, did you see that? He said, give this symbol to the rebels that they might end their grumbling. He could have just said, believe me. But he gives them signs to help them with their sin. He gave them the symbol of the plague stopping at the priest, the symbol of the staff of Aaron's priesthood blossoming. These are gracious signs to would-be rebels to believe. And did you see what they did in response? Commentators are a little divided on this. They say, oh, this is maybe good that they're afraid of the Lord. It seems they're still grumbling. And so I've known people said, oh, oh, but if only I had a sign from God. (laughs) Have you ever heard the saying, don't believe your lying eyes? Have you ever heard that saying? It's when you are seeing things out there that seem to contradict the narrative that you have been propagandized with. You have a narrative that the news or some tyrant or some charlatan trickster has told you, but then you see something directly contradictory with your eyes and, you say, and don't believe your lying eyes. It's, it's a, a joke. You should believe your eyes. Don't believe the lies that you have been told. And so the Lord is putting things before their very eyes, but they don't want to believe them because they want to think, Not Aaron, surely not Aaron, not that high priest, not Jesus. Because Jesus is now our high priest and he is such a better high priest. Aaron, Aaron died. He lies in the grave. We need a living high priest. And Christ is a far better high priest than Aaron. We've seen Aaron's foolishness with regard to when Moses went up to give the law. He made them a calf. He made an idol directly against what the Lord had said. He came with his sister Miriam in the rebellion against against Moses. We have seen him weak uh, with, with his sons. 
Christ is a far better high priest than Aaron. Let us not rebel against him. Christ walked toward the danger of the cross. We see Aaron walking toward the danger of the plague, but Christ walked toward the danger of the cross. He saw the cross. He knew it was coming. He said, my hour has not yet come. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. He saw it and he walked toward the danger zone of God's wrath for you, to intercede for you. And Christ took up the symbol of death as a means of salvation. The cross, the cross was a symbol of torture, was a symbol of Roman oppression. All the things that a Jew would have hated, they would have looked at that thing and thought, anything but that. I hate Roman oppression. I hate torture. I hate death. This was the symbol of all those things. And look what Christ did to it. He took the very symbol that we associate with evil and wickedness and awfulness, and he makes it a symbol of life for us. Just like the snake that uh, was lifted up in the wilderness. We'll get to that story. Uh, Christ says, now I'm the one who's lifted up. Look to me. He takes this symbol of death and turns it into a symbol of life. Christ used symbols to prove his priestly role. What symbols does he give for our eyes and hands and nose? He gives us symbols of baptism and the Lord's Supper before your very eyes for you to see another example of you are not your own. The Lord has his mark on this child just like he has his mark on you. You are not yours, your own. You're to be his. And the symbols of the Lord's Supper. He says, this is the good life. This is wine and bread with friends, with the Almighty This is what it's like to be in relationship with me. He gives symbols to rebels so that you'll stop your grumbling. See those symbols before your very eyes and stop your grumbling. And yet it gets better. This this symbol that he gives, the the, the budding staff of of, of Aaron. And do do you know who you are in this story? As you look at this story, you think, oh, who am I in this story? Are you Moses or Aaron or one of the other leaders? Think of yourself as the dead twig. You're the dead twig in this story. You don't do too much. You have a name on you. But that's about it. But the Lord can bring life to dead twigs. Look at what he says in John 15. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of what I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You see this branch uh, symbolizing Aaron's uh, staff and his priesthood. It's like it had been spiritually connected to the life force, the holy spiritual lifeness that is the Lord God. And so it couldn't help but sprout all sorts of life. And you, if you are connected to the Lord God by faith through Christ, you will produce spiritual fruit, beautiful fruit. Do you know what uh, almond is in Hebrew, the word for the tree? It's similar to awake, awake. Because almond is tr- tree is early awake. It buds, it flowers early. May you have early fruit from the Lord as you become spiritually awakened to what he is doing and what can be done in your life through him. Has anybody ever gone swimming in a deep pool? Some of you you guys have been to Guppy Gulch. In Guppy Gulch and in other places, there is what's called a picnocline. A picnocline. It is a change as you go down the water And it's warm up here, and then you go down, and it gets very cold very fast. And there is a sort of picnocline in the Christian life. It is dead up here where you're unconnected to Christ. 
But there is a, a line. As soon as you cross it, as soon as you start abiding in Christ, you will feel it. You will want to be producing the fruits of the Spirit. You won't be able to help it as you abide in Him. You will feel it, and you will be fruitful as you are connected to the Lord. So, abide in Christ. Let's pray.